Yeah, yeah sure. Um, so uh, I'm Tina Benson. I am the Director of Operations at London Northwest Healthcare. Um, I'm based at the Trust Headquarters, which is Northwick Park, Watford Road, Harrow. Um, the evidence supplied to the Commission is a letter written by the Interim Chief Executive when our Permanent Chief Executive David McVitie was off having his hip surgery, um, which is why he wrote the letter. Uh, we have since had a new Chief Executive, Dame Jacqueline Doherty, who started with us five weeks ago. Um, so it was decided since that I was involved with the changes to the A&E at Central Middlesex and uh, more latterly with the proposed transition of the maternity services at Ealing Hospital, that I was probably the most appropriate person to come and answer the Commission's questions. Thank you very much for coming. I wanted to start, not unnaturally, with the proposals of the aliens at Hammersmith and uh, Second Sex. And your document, uh, unsurprisingly, deals only with Central Middlesex Hospital. Did you share the view that Hammersmith Hospital should be shut at the same time? So um, we set up a process across the Northwest London sector as part of this, and, and that was for all operational directors um, for the, across the sector because it was important to us that we took those decisions as a system. Um, we considered closing them separately. We felt that would be confusing for patients and considering that we were doing this particularly as a, as a trust for patient safety and trying to reduce the risk of having Central Middlesex emergency closure over the winter, we decided together that yes, it was the most appropriate thing to close them at the same time. Did you have any concerns at all about the capacity of Norfolk Park and other facilities to soak up the work of two other AMEs at the same time? So we had some very detailed work in terms of planning for this change and I, I won't detail it all but just quickly, um, there was the original numbers um, in the SAF business case, we then remodelled the most recent numbers for both sites. We also did patient questionnaires to check whether our assumptions around flows were likely to be correct uh, in terms of asking people at Central Middlesex and Hammersmith if this unit wasn't here, where would you most likely go? Um, we then, if I just talk about Northwick Park, we knew that there would be very limited flow from Hammersmith to Northwick Park, one patient a day in fact. Um, so in terms of Northwick Park, for which I'm responsible, um, we didn't have any concerns at all about the Hammersmith closing. Um, in terms of then Central Middlesex to Northwick Park, um, we modelled, and, and it, as I said before by Professor Ursula Gallagher, actually our challenges are bed capacity, not actually A&E capacity, so the attendances are not a specific concern to us. Admissions are a concern, so that was the piece of work we did in a great deal of detail to look at how many admissions would be coming to Northwick Park. Um, we felt we had enough capacity to manage that and going back to the point that we weren't meeting our a and &E target so that we knew what we were aiming to do was to not make things worse and to try and keep things stable in the system and for us as a trust it was a balance of risk. So there was the risk of knowing that we had a capacity challenge at Northwick Park versus the potential of the inability to staff Central Middlesex medical take over the winter period and having to do an emergency closure. So we had some ongoing concerns, but we felt that we'd planned well enough to maintain safety, which was always key. So do you share the view that the subsequent downturn in performance at Northwick Park Hospital was unrelated to the closures? So, uh, in fact, our model has come to absolute fruition. I have a detailed model which shows flows of patients. So, in brief, 12 patients were to be admitted from the central Middlesex previous catchment area. That's exactly what we have been admitting. The additional surge over and above that has been largely Harrow patients, which is unrelated to the central Middlesex closure. Can I ask you this, in terms of volume three, page 117, and if I explain that this is a graph that is submitted by a gentleman called Colin Stanfield, uh, and I see a female smile that you're entirely familiar with. So I provide Colin with most of his yes. data. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very helpful because then I can, I, can, I can admit to ask whether you think he's got accurate data. Because it's clearly, you would have surprised him with accurate data. Uh, what I wanted to just ask you about was how this, how this graph fits with what you've been saying. Because I don't pretend to be a statistician or to have any kind of expertise in this, but 
Looking at the, um, the figures there, he's disaggregated the various uh, different sort of um, fi fi figures that you can arrive at. And Ealing and North West London Trust seems to be from 14th of uh, September last year to the 12th of December this year on a catastrophic downturn. Now, now how does that, how do you explain why it's so much worse than all of the others? So actually, I think if you disaggregated this one level further, you'd see that um, Ealing is not on catast uh, catastrophic downturn. Um, they had the same surge as previously described in terms of the whole winter and have completely recovered. And in fact, last week delivered 95% type 1 activity. So I would dispute that Ealing is a challenge. Um, in terms of Northwick Park, if we look back for a complete year, so the winter that we've just had to the winter that we had before, actually our type 1 performance this year was a lot more stable and resilient than it was the previous year when Central Middlesex was open. I, I, I understand what you're saying, but I, I don't understand. It may simply be that I don't understand how that equates with what looks on a visual basis like an extremely sharp downturn. So I don't. So I don't think. I think if you disaggregated this, what you would see is Ealing did this, and Northwick Park has always been this. So and the, the so the Ealing had in the in the period shown before September had been propping up the Northwick Park Type One performance. So, so your your contention is that the, the, the two were entirely unrelated. The two situations: the downturn, the missing of. Target time, time related. So what, what I'm saying is Northwick Park has been missing the target for a long time um, and therefore, and in fact this year, we were more resilient in terms of Type 1 than the previous year when Central Middlesex was open. And, and what are the up-to-date figures at the moment for uh, targets in Northwick Park? So uh, last week at Northwick Park for all type performance, which is the one that includes the urgent care centre, was 88%. For Type 1, it was 69%. Um, that's for this last, what, what period is that? That's a week. That's a week. Are you able to provide a slightly longer? Yeah, I can provide that to you. Not off the top of my head, but I can provide uh, uh, that. Can you tell us whether the figures in the weeks approaching that are similar? Or, or are they very so at the moment, um, the figures are improving. So since December, we have steadily, and I mean steadily, so literally sort of 0.1 percent week on week improving at Northwick Park. And as I said, Ealing has completely recovered its previous position. So the Type One admissions at Northwick Park, if they're at 69 percent, does it mean between December and now they've been lower than that? So type one attendance is not admissions. So yes, previously they were down to around 66% as being about the lowest point. So, so what does that suggest in terms of reliance on the problems having been related to seasonal variations? So, I, so we saw an early surge in activity from August. Um, we haven't seen any reduce in, reduction in demand as yet. Um, if and when the hospital and but even though, because Chancos is a slightly different matter, if the money in the hospital any closes, will that put more pressure on the service at Northwood Park? So I haven't got any plans as being the responsible director to close Ealing A&E, and in fact I'm working with my Ealing team at the moment to expand their footprint in A&E at Ealing. So are you saying that A&E, uh, Ealing isn't going to close? So I'm saying that at the moment there isn't any plans to close Ealing A&E Hospital and certainly the Trust clinical strategy would not want to see that happen until we were convinced as a Trust Board there was sufficient capacity to allow that to happen, if that remained the plan. So how do you think? Can I just interrupt? I, I, you said something about expanding a footprint. Yeah, Ealing A&E. Can you share and then explain what on earth it means? Oh, sorry, so the physical space at Ealing A&E, we're looking to make it a bit bigger because it's an incredibly small department. So it only has 12 trolleys, so if you compare that to Northwick, which has 43. So just a particular yeah, sorry. So, uh, leading on from that, you're expanding the Ealing A&E at the moment. So we're just expanding the space to allow them to cope with the activity that's currently, currently coming through the door. I know that you don't know when it will close, and you're saying there are no current plans to close it. But if it closes, is it not simply a matter of logic that there will be an increased volume of, of patients and therefore increased pressure on Northwick Park? 
So if we were to look at closing um, Ealing, if you look at, th so exactly the same as I described in terms of the work we did around Central Middlesex and Hammersmith, if you look at the likely flows of patients, which we haven't yet done in the detail I described, but if you go back to the original SAF case, actually a very small proportion of patients who currently go to Ealing A&E would flow to Northwick Park, and, and part of that is the geographical nature of North West London. I was just going to come on to that. How accessible is Northwick Park for residents of you? Um, so uh, I think it is reasonably accessible. Both have reasonably good tube links. I think bus links aren't as good as they could be. Um, in terms of emergency care, clearly there are other ways to get to hospital, other public transport. So LA, in terms of LAS, the flows tend to be not across the A40 during peak times, but actually it's not inaccessible. Um, as a trust, we are looking at, as we potentially change flows later on, whether we would provide some patient transport between our sites. So that's a, something we'll keep in mind, but it hasn't been modelled. So we haven't made any major changes between sites currently, between Ealing and Northwick, so it's not required at this time, but it is something we would look at as we model any further changes. Is there a risk, if longer journeys are involved, that patients will be um, ill by the time that they reach A and E and, and are able to be treated? So whilst I am a clinician by background, I'm, I'm not a doctor, um, so I think I'd find it quite difficult to answer that. I, I guess in my experience of the closure from central Middlesex to Northwick, it's not been what we've seen in that change. So given the geographical relationship between Northwick Park, West Middlesex and Ealing, and having heard what Dr Palmer has to say, could there be some merit in having Ealing uh, uh, become a major hospital? So if I look at it um, from just a trust perspective rather than necessarily an ealing population perspective for a minute, if you just forgive me. Um, so we consistently review all our services across sites and I think the thing that's really important to us as an organisation is to make sure that we have the right skills to provide the care that we want to, care for, that to give to people. Where we had what the challenge for us for Central Middlesex was making sure that there were sufficient skills nationally to do that. So I I would suggest it would be hard for us as a as an organisation to run several large acute trusts or even for the sector in terms of getting enough skilled people to deliver the quality of care that we want to. Mm, but if the funding was there and the political will was there, would it be? ideal because of its geographical placement, would it be an ideal spot to locate a major hospital? So in terms of funding, we've never had any challenges around funding. Sure. Um, we had the funding in the budget for enough consultants to run Central Middlesex A&E. We've got for enough funding in the budgets to run A&E at Ealing and at Northwick. We don't have enough consultants permanently on our books because they're just not there. So I wouldn't say that this is a funding issue, this is a skills issue. Um, in terms of would Ealing be an ideal place for a major acute, um, I, I don't think it's about necessarily location, it's about the services and skills we can provide in each hospital and the co-location of other services and I think we need to look at that as a whole and not isolate out one particular hospital or other. I just want to ask very briefly about bed space, your uh, increasing bed space at Northwick Park. Um, isn't the whole premise of SAP about reducing the heat? So I can't comment because I, I just don't know the detail across the whole thing but it has always been the plan to increase Northwick Bar Park by about 100 beds. Uh, um, is that enough? Uh, so it's enough currently as I sit here today. Um, we are, there are a few things we need to do um, as a wider health system to make sure that remains to be enough. Um, and I think Ursula described some of those, so I won't repeat it, but it is about patients who are currently in uh, an acute bed who could have different care outside of the trust, and that is a significant portion. It's about 40 to 50 patients on any one day. But at the moment, doesn't it suggest that there's a rising, there's still a rising in terms of affording need for bed space? So at the moment, since our surge in August, it's been fairly flat. It hasn't risen again, but as I said before, it hasn't fallen yet in terms of is it spring and summer. I just want to ask you very briefly about um, some of the funding issues. Can, can you explain, and for the reference, it's volume two, uh, and I'm looking at pages 614, 615, 
and this is for FPPG, uh, and it's a matter about how they talk about marginal cap rates. Can you explain to us, your view, how does a marginal cap rate work, and how does it control any work? Oh, that's quite complicated. Okay, I'll try and make it. No, I was trying to make it simple. So, okay, so um, there was a change to the way that hospitals are paid nationally. Uh, the thought behind it was to try and look at how you could, from the same money, encourage services outside of hospitals. So, as a system, we looked at how many patients in 2008, nine attended A and E's and we said that's our baseline to start from. So any activity which comes to uh, an A&E over and above that baseline only attracts 30% of the normal payment for that patient. However, the 70% is then invested in services outside of hospital in order to try and reduce the attendances. So I got this right. Okay. So took a patient as a person who was over the, the expected numbers to go to that A&E, the baseline. You could slice them in half, and 30% of the funding that came with them would go to the A&E, and 70% would stay with the, C, the CCG. Is that, is that right? To invest in services outside yeah. of hospital, yes. Okay. Um, what seems to be said, and I'm just going to invite you to comment on this. Can you have a look, please, at volume two, and it's page 615. Yeah. Uh, paragraph 1.9. Yeah. Uh, what's being suggested, it talks about the Northwick Park Hospital marginal cap, uh, and it's sort of, I think it's referring to the tension that that may cause between what a CCG might want in terms of funding and what the hospital trust might. Uh, and there's reference to uh, what's described as a tug of war behind the scene. And can I ask you to comment on, on whether that's something you recognise? <coughs> So, so I think so. we have a whole wide health system for which we all have to ensure we provide the best care that we can afford for all of our patients. So it's, it's really important that through contracting rounds that there is a healthy tension between the trust and the CCG. Uh, clearly the trust wants the most money it can get in order to continue to provide all of the services at, at the gold standard and the CCG have other things to commission other than just the hospital services. So I think that's a healthy tension. However, I will say that we have had good negotiations with um, our lead commissioner, which is Brent CCG, and they did last year up the baseline from the 2008-9 level. Um, and look, and in, and in addition, they did not remove the activity from central Middlesex. They left that in our baseline. So actually, they have increased our baseline. This year, the national rules change, and actually, that reduction is less. So there is, whether healthy or not, inherent tension between what you want to do with the funds and what the CCG might So no, so th that's not what we want to do with the 70%. It's about us trying to increase that oh, bottom number. In terms of the 70%, there's always been very good agreement about what is re reinvested, and a lot of that is reinvested into the hospital trust in the terms of the STAR service. But it's about how much of the, how much of the 100% comes to... No, it, no, it's not. Sorry, it, it's about so it's about how many patients we only get the thirty percent for. We always argue about that, um, and then it is about um, which services would would be best invested in. So there is always a debate about that because clearly there's a very acute view, which is the view we have, and there's a very community view that the commissioners might have. Can I just ask you to comment on them? And further down this page, there's a quote from a meeting which is said to have taken place on the, it's paragraph 1.11, 17th of December 2014. It's a quick a quality innovation productivity and protection meeting. And if I just read out the quote because not everybody's got it. Um, the clinical director stressed the need to use financial penalties and decommissioning to achieve better services from uh, LMWHT and expressed great concern that despite assurances over the years from the Trust, there was still a deterioration in performance and services and that additional funding under winter pressures may not improve performance. A broader debate was called for to bring to the attention of the Trust the frustrating dependence of the GP that the GPs had at the service provided to their patients over the last 20 years. The GPs had no confidence in the, in the LNWHT managerial side, nor in the manner its clinical teams run their departments, nor in the A&E service. Um, can I invite you to comment on those criticisms, please? What, what do you say about them? So I think um, 
so I can't comment on this particular quote because I don't know, I wasn't there, I don't know, so I, I can comment more generally. So I think um, we have very good meetings between our clinicians and the GPs um, at the clinical quality group. Um, there are There is challenge raised to our doctors, our managers and the services we provide and rightly so. It's important that the CCGs are assured that we are providing the services at the quality for which they are commissioned. Um, I think equally we challenge back in terms of uh, the CCG doing the things that they say they're going to do in terms of referral management. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily plan to comment any further, but I, I think actually relationships are very good between our clinicians and the CCG. So, um, volume three, page nine four seven, is a matter of sentences. There's a formal complaint by uh, your trust about the CCG's, CCG's procurement. Um, Sorry, what page was it? Uh, it's volume three, it's page 947, it's the starting page. And I think it's a, it's a document which, I think this is in a document which in fact uh, you've signed, it's been CC'd to the it's not going to be signed, it's only been CC'd into it. Um, page 951, paragraph 4.14. What said the trust submits that NHS Brent, which is the CCG, is not acting with a view to improving the, cardi the quality of the cardiology services. And then further down, there's no evidence to suggest the clinical quality outcomes will be improved by the approaches taken by the CCG. But doesn't that rather suggest to you that there is in fact quite a degree of difficulty in the working relationship between you and the CCG? So I don't think it means generally that there's difficulty in the working relationship, I think, over this specific issue. Um, they had made a decision which we uh, didn't think was correct and we challenged it in the appropriate way. Do you think that could have an impact on delivery of services? For cardiology? Yes. So we, we, didn't, we didn't agree with the way that it was commissioned and we've made that clear. I think, um, as uh, Professor Gallagher has said, is that they will be keeping a close eye on the quality and we would trust them to do that. And the CCG awards the tender elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, presumably, that involves a loss of income to the trust, doesn't it? Potentially, yes. Yeah. And, and that, that's going to have a knock on effect, isn't it, on the viability of the site or the particular service that lost the tender? So it would potentially have an impact on the viability. Uh, currently, in terms of cardiology, we have continued to maintain the service that we provided before, and we haven't seen any detriment as yet to income. So, uh, so me, the service has been tendered out by cardiology. So a different, so a different provider is now providing it, and you're also providing it. So we've continued to carry on providing a service at Central Middlesex because there's still patient choice. So there are now two services being provided instead of one. Is that a service that's supported by the CCG or not? So the, the CCG haven't commissioned that particular service. So it's a continuation of a current service which is, hasn't been commissioned. So I, I, it's difficult to say supported or unsupported. All I can say is commissioned. Right, so are these two services which overlap? Are they providing the same service to the same population or different services to different populations? So I don't have enough clinical detail to ask the answer that question, I'm afraid. If, if services move away, say for example from Northwood Park, because they're commissioned elsewhere, what implications does that have for the hospital? So it clearly depends on the type of service, but um, we would always look at uh, potentially why that service is moving away. I think in most, most occasions we've had very healthy conversations with the CCGs where there's been quality issues and we have improved those. Um, if a service is commissioned at, from another organisation, decommissioned from us, um, we clearly have to look at disinvesting in that service or continuing that service at risk, depending on the service. Just very briefly, uh, assuming if there are services for which no one wishes to tender, um, does the trust get left holding the less attractive, less, less lucrative services? I think that uh, it's really hypothetical. I've never known that situation. We've never known a situation where there's no tent, nobody wishes to take up a bid. Not, I've not personally known. 
Right. Well, I, I suppose if I ask you, you can say you're not prepared to ask, but hypothetically, would you be left holding the baby? I, 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 can't, I can't see that that would be a, a, a scenario. Um, I think probably those are all the questions that I can respectively ask in this time frame, so I'll be grateful if you break the questions. No. I just uh, I've done my best in this process to step back and get the overall feel of what's happening. And as I've said, I have great respect for the amount of hospital services that have been developed. I think they to do with good medicine and good practice. And also making family doctors well so much more interesting. Um, but that doesn't take away my worries on behalf of my fellow citizens and my patients are on respective secondary care. And uh, one of our initial witnesses um, from Imperial, unfortunately they're not represented here, I know, I might ask you to take a view, um, said he thought in the three years since 2012 that had been a major change in the way medicine had been was practiced. And that, um, for example, um, he said that we were admitting uh, much more elderly patients and doing things to them that we wouldn't have considered doing three or four years ago. And that in turn, they need acute hospital beds and moreover may often may need the most intensive type of care and yet do it extremely well. I can quote I, I an example of a relative in her 90s who had a bowel change. Things that 10 years ago we wouldn't have considered that you're changing the valves of people who are terminally ill with only six months life expectancy because it can improve their quality of care. Now that is, I can see one arrow going out of hospital services, as I've said, a thing, a laudable thing, a wonderful thing, if it can be done. But this other arrow going this other way to do with technology and that the Shaft project is trying to close down beds and close down secondary services you know, I suppose the Commission is think, thinking of it's a bit like Beecham in the 1960s, but probably before you were born, I know, uh, who closed down the railways and suddenly we discover we need railways, such as the point that only uh, recently, six months ago, 40 miles of uh, railways being reopened. Now, do you not have those, if you're, you're obviously familiar with it, from the quality aspect, do you not have those concerns as well that we're giving away all these assets? all this land, which we can never get back. So, no, I don't share the concerns. And, and the reason I don't is I can really see how the jigsaw fits together. So, so I can see how out of hospital care. So, so I go into A&E on a daily basis because, as we've said, our performance is not as where we want it to be. So I'm there on a daily basis. So I can see firsthand the type of patients coming in. And I can almost, in my head, see where they would be in the future. And there is, a, there is at least 40 to 50 every day who I could see could have better care and never have touched A&E at all. There are the patients you've clearly described who are acutely unwell and quite often are more frail um, and do need to be in an acute bed. But actually, in terms of do they need to be in an acute, be acute bed for a, a long period of time, no. Um, if I talk to my doctors, they say that most people need that acute phase for about four days. And then there is a whole big step down facility. So we, so as, as Professor Gallagher said earlier, they've invested hugely in step down capacity. We've got across our trust with Brent, Harrow and Ealing, we've got 200 community beds. Um, and then from there, you step down into social care and back into those community services. So, so whilst I hear your concern, I really can see that jigsaw working, um, but it's going to take a lot of energy and effort to get us there. I wish I had your uh, yeah, I'm just going to ask you about the um, going back to the A&E performance. And this was type one, you, I think you said 69% was the most recent figure yeah. um, of people um, achieving the target being seen and dealt with within four hours. Um, that's what, late April or May? 
Yeah, that's yeah. May, end of so first week of May. So we haven't seen any decline in attendances since that surge in August. So we haven't. So we went up and then we've just stayed broadly flat from there. So where is the problem? What, what, what is, what, why is it that none of these promised alternatives seem to have actually delivered um, the release of the um, pressure on the, uh, on the A&E service? That's another complicated question. So, um, if I if I just talk very well, uh, the reason I'm asking yeah, yeah. is because no, obviously the plan is supposedly yeah. that we won't need so many of these services. Yeah. So th there's different strands though in terms of our trust. So if I look across our trust, um, it, actually the attendances at Ealing Hospital have declined. So that is is where it should be. If I look at Type One attendances over the last five years at Northwick Park, they've declined, and actually the ones that are going up are the urgent care centre Type Three. Uh, we have seen this surge. The challenge for us is bed capacity. Once we get that bed capacity right on the Northwick site, we've got 63 beds opening before this winter. Um, my expectation is that we will resolve much of that issue. The other piece of work that we're doing is to get those patients who I described who are post that four-day stay into community facilities. If we get that flow right, I think we will have the services externally have taken the pressure off. It's just being masked by the fact that we don't currently have the right level of bed capacity. But these community facilities will need investment and resources. Absolutely, and we're currently looking with our CCG partners about how we might do that in a more efficient way because the other thing that we also need is flexibility so that we can always meet the needs of patients no matter what their need is rather than having a very fixed set of beds for one particular need. So I'm just going to come on to the other side of resources, which is obviously the trust is in quite a substantial financial hold at the present time, £50 million plus deficit on the last account I saw. Um, now, on the one hand, there's talk about moving, I know you've said there's no immediate plans to close the A&E at Ealing, but the, the plan in the south is for the Ealing to become a local hospital, uh, which would have basically, would have outpatient, would have urgent care centre and possibly some day surgery and so forth on site. On an economic level, how does that actually work for the trust? Because you're not going to be generating anything like the income that would have been coming from there before. And you're still going to have a requirement to staff and deliver services there. Yep, so economically, so obviously the business cases are at a very high level at the moment. They're not down to, to that sort of level in terms of the, the broader picture. Um, but actually it, it is achievable because this, you also reduce your costs in those hospitals that are, are, are reducing to local hospitals. Um, but it, it, it is, a, it is a, a careful balance that has to be met and clearly for our organisation especially carefully because that's three sites plus we've also got 29 community sites. So, so yes, it is a challenge and we keep a very close eye on that in terms of what services will be provided there in the future. So just finally then, how are you going to say that's a question that I wish I could answer. If it was easy, we'd have done it already. Thank you. I don't have any further questions for you. Thank you very much Thank for you. attending. Um, what I suggest is we break now until quarter to.